Spotlight on safeguarding in faith communities. Hello, I'm Nastasia, and this is Spotlight On, a podcast by the Safeguarding Resource and Support Hub. Spotlight On is a new series where we take a deeper look at one organisation's approach to safeguarding that has been particularly successful or innovative. These are short and practical insights from the ground that aim to inspire. On this episode, we talk to Shaukat Waraich, an award-winning social entrepreneur and CEO of Faith Associates, about safeguarding in faith communities. Faith Associates is an organisation that has been developing safeguarding practices in places of worship, such as mosques and madrasas in the UK and abroad, including Tanzania and Zanzibar. He has authored several publications and is a public speaker. We talked to him about how he started to engage Islamic faith communities on safeguarding and how he was able to build trust on this really sensitive issue. He shares just fascinating stories about how he Islamicized safeguarding training programs and how quality and celebrating success is an important part of his approach. Hi, Shaukat. Thank you so much for joining us today. Pleasure. Lovely to be here. So you are the founder and CEO of Faith Associates. Can you tell us a bit about your story and how you came to set up this consultancy? So back in 2004, we established Faith Associates to fundamentally help emerging, probably ethnic minority communities with their faith institutions, whether they were mosques, gurdwaras, temples, basically helping them with their legal frameworks, with their constitutions, with their accounts, and basically helping them to map out a sustainable future. Safeguarding is obviously a a big part of the work that you do with um, the mosques and madrasas that you're working with. Now, as you know, safeguarding is such a sensitive topic and many can find it difficult to address it um, because it means sort of accepting that abuse can take place. Um, Could you tell us in really practical terms how you were able to build enough trust um, that's needed to begin to address this really sensitive topic? Yes, yeah, a very good point. Uh, the key word there is trust. Before I quickly talk about this issue, is that how did we get to this whole safeguarding uh, arena that we've definitely become specialists in? Back in 2006, a stroke seven, I wrote the first book of its kind in the world around how to govern and manage uh, mosques and Islamic centres. So through our work, we realised that there wasn't any toolkits or guidance out there in the Western world to particularly help mosques and madrasas. And when I released the book, I I put it in a PDF format and we gave it out for free. Uh, And thousands of people downloaded it and asked us to come and engage with their institutions on the back of that book. And one of the things that we do do when we are engaging faith communities and when we're trying to help them, we do an audit. We audit the institution um, and we basically do a deep dive into their governance and management structures. And one thing that we realised that many of these institutions didn't have safeguarding at the core of, of, their, of their governance strategy. Whether it was safeguarding financing, whether it was safeguarding people's welfare in, uh, in the institution that people visit, or whether it was safeguarding within the madrasa where you had hundreds if not thousands of children operating there on a weekly basis. So when we did the governance uh, audits, uh, we realised that there was a big missing component. But obviously before we did the audits, we'd, we'd, we'd consult the, the management and we'd say, ex- explain to them that the audit is going to be conducted this way. Everything that we do is going to be confidential. We are not going to share this report with anybody. And this report even will only present it to you in hard copy format. We won't even email it to you. So the danger of somebody sending that audit somewhere else is is removed. So we got the buy-in of the leadership that this is completely uh, uh, confidential. And then when we present the findings to you, they will be only to the management and the recommendations that we provide are there for you to implement, but if you'd like us to implement, we would uh, be happy to help you. So the trust element was critical. Uh, I I don't think these faith institutions 
would invariably allow anybody to look under the covers uh, unless they were trusted parties. And then obviously when we started to befriend and engage and cooperate with leaderships of these institutions, people would open up and discuss some very sensitive topics. What would happen uh, as well when people heard that there's an external organisation coming to audit the mosque, we would be approached by people of the community as well that would tell us things about what was happening there as well. And that would take us into the other big project that the mosques are, being, are running is the madrasa. Um, and I can talk later possibly about the whole madrasa arena where children come on a day-to-day -day basis to learn scripture in these places. You know, from the audit we realised that this was a very big area of work of mosques and there was unfortunately very little safeguards in place. Thanks. So, so really it was the promise of confidentiality then from there, sort of maintaining, establishing and maintaining a really close working relationships with um, the leadership. Correct. So <clears throat> essentially, even before we were invited in to discuss the idea of institutionally improving that place, uh, there had to be some level of trust and I think that trust came from word of mouth that people heard that oh, there's an organization here if you've got these challenges work with them they're, they're very they're very responsive and they're very uh, uh, culturally sensitive and they also understand the nuances of your faith and your culture and they'll be able to navigate you through the the corporate the institutional the governance the legal frameworks that are essential in running a medium or small or large institution. So before we were invited in, uh, it was very much, um, I think there was some credibility there, but when we met them and worked with them, uh, I think that credibility increased with the professionalism of our approach. Great, thank you. And, and do you think that it helped that you were from the same faith community? I mean, uh, definitely from from the from the Muslim and Islamic communities, we we were. Uh, I think that was a big help for most people, uh, because uh, in terms of understanding practices, and then obviously providing solutions within the cultural context was very important. So when we offered solutions to them to safeguard activities that were commensurate to their Islamic legal position or jurisprudence position, we had a very good insight into what was acceptable legally and not acceptable legally from a British legal system point of view as well as the Islamic legal system point of view. So that, that was definitely a, a plus point, but clearly it gave the confidence to people to invite us in to do some very sensitive work actually, very sensitive work. Um, I guess, yeah, highlighting, I think, the importance of, um, you know, a really contextualised approach and making sure that solutions are, you know, appropriate for the specific organisation or institution that you're supporting. 100% because the team actually we have at the moment is not just a male team of the Muslim tradition, but we have females as well. So in these institutions, you have a, literally two parallel systems. You have, in some places, women's prayer halls, women's kitchens, women's entrance points are different to men's. Some of the leaderships are separate, you know, women are working in their own, within their own domain. So we, you know, some institutions are very strict to say that if you want to engage w uh, the women in our organization, you have to have a woman on your team. So we had, we've got women in our team that are safeguard spe safeguarding specialists. When we went to other faith organizations, whether it's Sikh or Hindu, we have people of other faiths as well in our team that also give them the uh, the feeling that Faith Associates is not just a, an Islamic or a, a focused organization, even though most of our clients are from the Islamic tradition, we have other people in our team that can connect with other faiths as well. And we've, what we've also done is taken some of our other non-Muslim colleagues to Muslim institutions to kind of make them understand what what the cultural nuances are that they need to be aware of what it also does is that those faith, muslim faith institutions realize that this is actually can is not essentially uh, an us and them mentality or uh, this is a, something being imposed on the muslim tradition 
This is actually a universal cross-cultural, cross-religious strategy that governments, policy makers, institutional governance apparatus requires, and it's non-religious in the sense. What we've done in a sense is make it a bit more hybrid and add it in where religion and culture is actually reinforcing some of the safeguarding elements that are out there, saying that this is totally compatible and it's actually essential and it's actually what your faith demands of you when you're looking after vulnerable people, young people, children or anyone in your care. You have a duty of care and it's your religious obligation to do these things. So we've actually blended the whole issue around safeguarding faith and culture together and when we put it into that context, people have adopted it without any hesitation. This sounds so innovative, but also just, you know, a really sensible approach to link safeguarding concepts with, you know, religious and cultural concepts that the people that you're working with are already, you know, familiar with and understand. Because as you say, safeguarding is fundamentally about protecting people from harm. And this duty to protect the most vulnerable is not an alien idea. Um, so can you just tell us a little bit more about how you were able to Islamicize safeguarding concepts as you engaged with these um, faith institutions? So one of the big areas of work that we started to realise that was very vulnerable was the, the provision for uh, teaching scripture to children. We realised that the, the madrasa where children were being taught, unfortunately, didn't have safeguarding practices in place and we realized that this was such an important area to safeguard but how should we do it without scaring people without pointing the finger without uh, jeopardizing the goodwill that we already had because as soon as you start talking about these very sensitive issues people either get their backs up and say we're not involved or you accusing of us of some, doing something wrong or, you know, they become very defensive and we didn't want to do that. So what we did was that we, we took uh, at least five local authorities safeguarding information and Islamicized it. Literally embedded scripture, embedded religious stories, embedded sayings of great prophets of Islam and other religions into the level one safeguarding training program. So when we started to deliver the training, the level world training to say madrasa teachers, madrasa head teachers, half of it seemed like this is like a religious sermon, as it were, or, or a religious, um, you know, these guys are teaching us some faith ideas that are completely understandable to them. And and we what we found was that it was totally received with, with 100% comfort. People were very comfortable with this narrative. Uh, and we didn't lose anything from what the local authority expected, the safeguarding board expected of us as a training body to basically deliver safeguarding training. And what that did was it just uh, completely opened up the whole territory of madrasa uh, training. And we wrote, I wrote another book about madrasa management within a safeguarding context in 2009, 10. And again, we distributed that for free. And then on the back of that, what we did was we established the first madrasa quality framework. This was very similar to Ofsted because this was an educational domain. We wanted to mirror what Ofsted does in mainstream schools, mirror that within the supplementary school sector. And then we, like Ofsted, had outstanding, satisfactory and failing or not adequate uh, and we used Arabic terms. One was called Mizan, Gosar and Firdos. These were kind of three levels of, in scripture called paradise. And as soon as we mentioned those words to the Islamic community, they totally got it. Uh, and when they felt that they were aspiring to something very good, people were asking, can we get involved with this kind of tiered levels of quality? And clearly even at the base level, which was Mizan, safeguarding was the central pillar of that whole area of, of quality benchmarking. That's so interesting and important to note that it hasn't meant changing the standards themselves in any way, but more about adapting the language that's being used and embedding it within the structure that's you know not only already understood, but also 
really respected. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about the difference between these these tiers? Yeah, so <clears throat> one of the things is that uh, before we start going down the process of helping them achieve a, st a standard, we obviously do an audit. And a lot of these projects, I mean, at the moment in the UK in particular, we have calculated that there's probably between three to 5,000 supplementary schools teaching scripture, Arabic scripture to young children. You're looking at around about 300,000 children. So that's big numbers. But this is a, a parallel education environment outside of mainstream school, which is not heavily funded, which is not funded at all by the government. This is privately funded by communities and it's run by fees given by parents. So the top tier, you know, literally is running like a school. Um, and what we found is that schools that are government funded have a madrasa with inside it that are running like after school clubs. So they've got all the health and safety and physical infrastructure and um, they have all the means at their disposal to have the very high quality teaching after school. The lowest level, which is Mizan, is, is primarily where we, we've been investing a lot of our energy because that's where the biggest vulnerabilities are. And these are, these are primarily projects run in community centres, uh, hired halls or mosques or Islamic centres in the evening or on the weekends. And to get people up to that Mizan standard takes time, depending on where they are uh, when we've done the audit. Obviously, the difference between Mizan and the top level is quite large. And we don't expect, for instance, uh, somebody who hires a hall on the weekend to get to that very high level, because that's in the school. But we expect uh, them to reach at least Mizan level, that if any auditor was to come from either the safeguarding board or local LEDO, you, you would expect that the older team would be uh, uh, DBS checked, would have all the safeguards in place, would be protecting um, the children in a safe way, similar to like a scout organisation. And do you recognise these institutions that reach the gold level or who make you know really great improvements over time? So, I mean, that's one of the things that we have in a sense championed in Faith Associates is this kind of let's celebrate success, let's reward success. And in the UK what we've done is that we've um, realised that sometimes a stick approach doesn't work but rewards and uh, exemplifying great practices uh, definitely seems to encourage people to get involved and we've uh, since, two th since 2018, we've launched the Beaker Mosque Awards in the UK. And the Beaker Mosque Awards has been getting bigger and bigger and bigger, and people are calling it the Moscas now. What we found was that uh, we, first of all, opened it up to uh, the community to vote for organisations that have been nominated. And we had over 500 nominations and nearly 40,000 people voted online for their institutions. And... One of the key aspects of this mosque uh, and madrasa award ceremony uh, is called the British Beacon Mosque Awards. Uh, is basically which institutions have got the right leadership, the right management, the right safeguards in place and delivering outstanding services. And we found that people have kind of engaged with us. We didn't know them. They said, we've heard that this organization won this award for X practices. Could you come and audit us and help us to get to that standard? which has been fantastic. So that we, we realised that by awarding people, celebrating their success, uh, exemplifying and showing good practices to wider society in the sector seems to motivate and galvanise people to reach those standards. And that's what I, that was our objective, that you can keep on talking about a subject, but people do not know what it looks like. But when you say... Uh, Madrasa X, Mosque Y has achieved uh, gold standard, silver standard, bronze standard. This is who they are. Would you like to come and visit them? They're having an open day and they see their practices. They see their governance material. They say, exactly, we could actually, we could actually achieve that as well. We've got the right team to do it. Can you come and help us? And that's how we've grown 
the audience base of Faith Associates. And now we're getting responses, not just from the UK, but around the world now. People are saying, how can we be part of this Beacon Mosque strategy as well, which is a, uh, that's something that we'd love to take overseas as well to spread this kind of good message of safeguarding and good practices. Yeah, I really like that. You know, framing it as something that is really positive um, can be much more constructive as an approach in the in the long term. As something that you you know aspire towards, and that's a positive thing, as opposed to framing it as a risk or a threat that you have to mitigate. Um, yeah, that sounds like a really interesting approach. Um, so my final question to you, Shaukat, um, for our listeners who are perhaps working in a small organisation and are at the start of their journey on safeguarding, um, what do you think is the main key thing that they can learn from, from your experience? I mean, that's a good question. I mean, th- this is something that we've seen, not just in the UK, because we work overseas as well. We've been working with the United Nations Development Programme. We've been working in Europe with the EU. We worked in the Scandinavian countries as well. One of the key issues, depending on, the, uh, irrespective of where the organisation is, one thing that we feel that you can have policies and procedures and documents, but they end up on the shelf unless you have a management and a management culture that basically is ready and willing to implement those procedures and policies. So first thing that we work on is that we've got you've got to have a governance management infrastructure even if it's one head teacher uh, with a with a handful of staff there has to be a point of contact and a point of leadership ready to evangelize and promote the concept of safety and unless the leadership is fully uh, in line with the idea of safety it doesn't work so first of all what we do is that we we say that before we start, we want to work with the management to make it understand about uh, what is safeguarding, why is safeguarding important, and how it's going to help you as an organisation and ultimately protect the people that you want to serve, number one. Number two, when management is, is brought into the vision of safeguarding, what we find is that it's the, the next two or three steps of working with teachers, working with parents, working with children, all slots into place because the management is backing you and supporting you. And and that's been, that philosophy, uh, irrespective of territorial implementation or language or faith or religion or culture, it, it's, it, it seems to work. So creating management structures, operational structures, so where safeguarding can reside uh, and then disseminate it from. Uh, I think that's a critical component uh, and the success that we've had is basically making sure that the senior leadership is aware and they are helping to implement and distribute the knowledge and uh, disseminate the culture of safety within within the organisations. That was Shaokat from Faith Associates. There were lots of interesting learning points so we've put them into an infographic which you can find and download in the description of this podcast. Faith Associates is also on our Safeguarding Consultants directory, which means that if you would like the support of Faith Associates in making improvements to your safeguarding policies or practices, then you can actually reach out directly through the RSH website. We hope you enjoyed this episode. If you'd like to share your experiences of engaging with faith communities or share your reflections on Shoutcat's approach, then please do comment on this post on social media and we can continue the conversation online. Thanks so much.